So thanks very much indeed for making it to Med Confidential's launch conference. Uh, Med Confidential is a new campaign uh, which Terry Doughty and I uh, coordinate, working with colleagues in other organisations with whom we've campaigned over the years on, uh, amongst other issues, health issues. Med Confidential came about because there is a massive change taking place within the NHS, which many people do know about, but which leads to a whole bunch of consequences, which we laid out in various ways uh, for you today, and that we believe everyone, certainly in England, which is where the main focus is at the moment, needs to know about. We were actually invited or asked to come and have a look at what was going on by former medical colleagues who said there was a problem and Terry and I who have been working together for the past two years helping other campaigning organisations uh, to, uh, to campaign, advising them and what have you, thought that this was so serious that we had to come back and campaign on it. So, what's it all about? Fundamentally, if people cannot trust that what they say to their doctor will be held in confidence, kept in confidence, then some, at least, will tend to withhold information or not tell their doctor something at all. And that puts not just their own personal health at risk, but possibly the public health as well. So if you attack or undermine the very principle of that trusted relationship between a doctor, a medical professional, a care professional and their patient or the service user, then you are basically undermining trust in the whole system. So what we need to do is to preserve the trust which doctors appreciate they have to have which social workers appreciate they have to have, which care professionals across the board appreciate they have to have, but is being taken away from them and from us in a whole range of different ways under a whole bunch of different policies. What we're here um, about right now is the merging of two very large complex sectors, the health and social care sector, or sectors. This is a policy which all of the main parties, the Conservatives, the Liberal Democrats and Labour, have adopted and are behind. So whatever happens in the Parliament, whatever government we have, this is something that we are going to be facing uh, under, you know, most reasonably expected governments for the foreseeable future. This Health and Social Care Act, uh, as it says, is already law. It was passed uh, in 2012, uh, end of March, and it came into force at the beginning of April, this month. As it came into force, um, all sorts of new bodies, some of which you may have heard of, read about, some of which you may not have heard of at all, uh, took over from the old structures or the previous structures of the NHS. Um, unfortunately, though it's been a year in the planning, even the commissioning board, which is the, the large sort of quango, the arm's length body that is now responsible for the entire budget of the NHS, 95.6 billion pounds this year, I believe, um, even though it knew that this 1st of April deadline was coming, it did not manage to do things in time, and so from the 1st of April at least until 8th, 9th, possibly 10th of April, it was the case that there was no legal basis, no legal grounds <coughs> for medical professionals inside the NHS to look at personally identifiable patient data for uses other than their actual direct medical care 
that was left unlawful. So do not believe that this is you know, a plan that is being executed by people you know, absolutely to time, on time, they're in control. They failed even to have the legal basis to look at data that the primary care trusts were looking at when they abolished the primary care trusts. This is the risk. We're talking about a bunch of people who are willing to let that happen. Next slide, please. This is just to give you a, a comparison. So before April the 1st, or before the Health and Social Care Act, a structure that I guess by and large we're fairly... Okay. By and large we're, we're fairly sort of aware, obviously we've got Parliament and the Secretary of State, a Department of Health, and then we've had things which we're all aware of, things like strategic health authorities, primary care trusts, NHS trusts, and what have you. There are a few bodies around, like Care Quality Commission and all these others. I think, broadly speaking, people in this room, certainly those who, who are involved in the health arena, are well aware of this model. So, Andrew, could you have that? Could we have the next slide, please? This is the simplification. Simplification that has occurred to the NHS structures. You can still pick out a few of the same things, obviously Parliament off to the side there, Secretary of State, Department of Health. You will find, as we go through the day, that a lot of the people who you think are ultimately responsible or accountable in all this have pretty much shuffled off to the edge of matters. It is this commissioning board as I say, that has its hand on, on the budget, which is purportedly in control. And these are the things which there's been a, probably a, a, the most sort of talk about, the clinical commissioning groups. So that's um, GP representatives and others at a more local level who are supposed to um, commission the health services providing to their, uh, their areas. But as you can see, it really isn't as simple as that. There are a whole bunch of, and all of these little green boxes here are completely, well, some of them are completely new, some of them have been around for almost a year. Other bodies as well. The responsibilities aren't always as clear as it may seem. That's a horrible diagram. If we could move on to the next one, which I've just simplified down for the purposes of today and for the talk I'm giving to you now. So as I said, Secretary of State and Department of Health the Department of Health is no, no longer you know, directly responsible for the NHS. It's the commissioning board. They've got all the money and they set the rules. The other interesting thing, a renamed thing, and we'll be coming to this a lot, is something called the Health and Social Care Information Centre. It used to be called the NHS Information Centre. But as an organisation, it actually pre-existed the NHS. The NHS Information Centre was the place where they lodged all of the World War II ID cards and World War II census population data. And when they formed the NHS, the NHS numbers that the first people were issued were their World War II ID card numbers. That has operated as a sort of, um, you know, off at the periphery, it's been holding lots of population data for many years, for generations in fact, and has mainly, largely been, up to now, a statistical, aggregate data body. The massive change that's happened under this new regime is that this now becomes the hub for all data flowing within the NHS. Okay? The other bit of the diagram you'll hopefully recognise is you and your GP. And the reason we've got these little barrels, these are the symbol for database, sometimes your GP doesn't actually hold your information on a machine that is physically located at their practice. Quite often nowadays, the information, your information may be held at a server farm under contract to the GP practice. It is still the GP in law and in practice, who is the data controller of your GP-held medical record. Yeah? So 
when you go to see your GP and you tell your GP something, the GP is the data controller of that information. It's about to change. Watch the, the shell game. These other bodies here, which I just quickly zipped through because they're not all, not all sort of immediately relevant. Obviously, we've got the clinical commissioning groups, but we've got some sort of bureaucratic structures or, or administrative control structures that also relate to these two bodies. We've got, obviously, the commissioning board, the big central organisation, has its own local area teams. So they're sort of shadowing or overlooking uh, people like the commissioning groups there, supporting, in uh, other phrases, supporting the commissioning groups. Some, uh, I think it's nine um, of these commissioning centres, uh, support units, have become what's called uh, data management integration centres. It's just a place where they start bringing the data at regional level instead of going straight to the central hub. Okay? The interesting, again, slightly worrying thing about this is these, until shortly before April the 1st, were unlawful too. They weren't um, laid out in the legislation. Uh, they had no um, lawful way of becoming a data processor in their own right, uh, so data controller in their own right, and they've had to do a quick fix, which is simply to second members of staff from these to the information centre so that they can administratively say, oh, it's part of the information centre. Again, really tenuous stuff. Um, and this is, these, like I say, this is nine regional processing centres where significant amounts of um, information, patient information, will be going to, through, being processed, and then passed up uh, to the information centre and around. These arrows are just to indicate, we'll get into a particular, particular flow, just to indicate information is going up either to these regional centres and then on, it's going straight up the information centre, the commissioning board takes data, you know, this gets passed around the commissioning structures. So there is a flow, and the whole idea and the explicit policy here is to massively increase the flow of data inside, and as we'll get to, outside the NHS. Next slide, please. So, what are we talking about? Let's be, let's be precise here. Patient identifiable data is the phrase that has been used. It's known within uh, the NHS. A new formulation is being used, um, we've seen it sort of pop up a bit more, called person confidential data, meaning roughly the same thing. You may have heard people say, uh, you know, people in the press, the, the, the commissioning board or um, the ministers, oh well, the data is going to be anonymised. Yeah? We'll have a whole workshop on that so you can find out what that means later on, but we are talking specifically about what happens to identifiable data, because it is the case that they are passing around, sucking up, extracting identifiable data. Yeah. What does that mean? Again, the next one. So, this is the only, um, well, only I could use this one. Um, some of you may recognise the format. This is an NHS number. This is my NHS number. It's the only one I could put up on the slide uh, and not feel guilty. Um, <laughs> How is that number identifiable? Does that number relate to me? Do you see that number? Do you see a guy, a tall chap with a ponytail, a you know, loud voice and a goatee beard? No. But, next slide please. If you have an NHS number, then that is the key to the address book. The address book of the NHS. It's called the Personal Demographic Service, and that number, that unique identifier, gives a whole range. I mean, if you zip down the one, I think it's 29 fields of data in total. The ones in red that I've highlighted are ones which are clearly identifiable, sensitive in certain cases, 
you know, combinations of which may be able to get you things like a duplicate birth certificate. Um, certainly, uh, they may have things like an ex-directory telephone number. Uh, so some highly sensitive information. And these ones at the bottom, which I put in just to indicate, um, you know, there are, you know, clearly, this system is being used to point to where your medical records are. Yeah? Unless they are highly sensitive, acknowledged by um, the system to be highly sensitive, um, you know, basically, you look someone up and you've got a way to link to their medical records. So you're one step away. This is why we say, you know, that number that you saw is identifiable. And next one, please. That number, which we just got recently got out by Freedom of Information, that is the number of people who have a smart card that allows them to legitimately access PDS in the NHS or on any NHS system. Getting towards, well, okay, it's 800,000, but getting towards a million people. That's a lot of people, and that's legitimate access. Uh, the Department of Health, when we asked, basically said, because uh, I asked not only, obviously, how many people legitimately have access, and I said, how many cards have been lost or stolen? And they said, we can't tell you. I challenged that, and they said, no, no, we really can't tell you. We can't tell you because in 2009 we decided not to know. We decided to make it the responsibility of individual health authorities or trusts to monitor the lost and stolen cards on their own patch, and they don't seek that information out or centralise that information at all. This is interesting, because you would think if an organisation is concerned about the security of its systems, about access to the information that I've just shown you, which I think everyone can see is potentially highly sensitive and certainly identifying, you would be a little bit, you know, you'd like to know how many of these cards maybe have been compromised, stolen, or what have you. They don't keep that information. So the only way to find out is if we actually went round to everybody, every NHS body that issues these cards, and ask them individually. Obviously quite a difficult or laborious task. But bear that in mind. I'll have a couple of, I think there's one more number in this, this deck later on. So a lot of people can look you up using that NHS number, which is the key to a lot of information. Next slide. Please. The other thing we need to understand for those of people who don't work in the NHS or haven't, haven't come across this aspect is what are called read codes. So, Reed, I used to think it was Reed, as in read something, it turns out it's a chap called James Reed, a doctor. Um, but, named for James Reed, read codes are the way that every single sort of event, um, every single diagnosis, every single thing that basically, interaction that occurs, has a code. The clinician, the doctor, whoever, you know, identifies what that is. And when information is stored on a computer to be passed around, put into your record, what have you, it will have a unique read code. That unique read code will be to do with a particular thing. And the examples here I've just taken from the, the, the I think one of those recent updates to one of the sets of read codes. Um, and each of those read codes will then have what the doctor sort of said or thought about that particular event a clinical note in free text. So it might read, E2003, anxiety with depression. Julia, a 15-year-old schoolgirl, um, you know, presented with anxiety with depression. She said that her father, actually she was, she was depressed because her father, the high, the high court judge, was having an affair. Yeah, the free text could be anything, and often is. Yeah? Uh, and it's stuff that may help a, a clinician make a, make a diagnosis, or, or it, which is relevant to that. But again, it can carry fantastically sensitive information with it. So, but understand, so when we talk about read codes, we are talking about a nugget of data that is identified with a code. It, that code means something, but it also is attached to some actual information about a person. Yeah? Okay. Have the next slide, please. 
So if we come back, we're now going to see how these things start to tie up. I just put it as a reminder, so we're going to be talking about commissioning board, information centre, and what happens with your GP. So, like we said we took a look at the general practice extraction service. This is a system which has been built already, installed into uh, a lot of the GP practices in England, across England already, um, and which operates in this very particular way. So, up at the information centre, there is a tool, what's called a query tool, called GPESQ. That's been built by ATOS. GPESQ sends down a data request to an extraction tool, GPESE, that is installed in or on every GP practice set of systems. And that will then run a query. It will, it will ask the data the database that the GP holds or the data systems that GP holds, it will ask it for a bunch of read codes. Yeah? The database spits back those read codes that match the ones that have been requested, and that goes into the extraction tool. The GP may or may not be able to check it at that point, and up to now, certainly, uh, I haven't always been using this tool, but up to now, you know, information leaving your GP practice has done so in aggregate form. You know, so many patients had this, so many patients did that, so many patients, I did this for so many other patients, sort of thing. There has been some identifiable data going off for different purposes, things that are called like risk stratification, identifying you know, patients that need particular interventions, what have you. But GPES is just a channel. Yeah? It's a way to get a request down. We want you know, anything that matches these read codes to go in here, look at where the actual read codes are held, and bring up data or make uh, make a report based on that data, which can be an aggregate, the identified, or identifiable form. And then that goes and is stored in what is, they're calling the safe haven at the information centre. There are some <coughs> uh, oversight or controls to this. So HSC, I see, doesn't just get up one morning and say, what data do I want? Oh, looks do it. There's a customer, someone's asking for the data, for some reason, for some purpose. In order to become a customer, you know, an outside body, a medical researcher, a company, what have you, has to um, apply to something called the Data Access Advisory Group, and they have to fulfill certain criteria. Once they're approved as a customer, they can then put in requests, and the requests are assessed by a body called, an independent body, called the IAC, the Independent Advisory Group for GPES, for this particular channel. So hopefully that's the sort of simplest, generic view of someone wants some data, they come to the information centre, having you know, been approved as a customer, they say, we want X, Y, Z. IAG looks at it and says, yes, OK, or no, go back, and then the request comes. I'll give you some numbers here, I'm told, uh, by GP colleagues, that an average sized GP practice will contain of the order of 10 million read codes. It's quite a lot. Yeah? That's not, there are 10 million different numbers. Can we go back one slide, please? Oh, it took maybe two slides. Yeah? So that, that's not that there are 10 million of these, yeah? but that stored with the bit of data about people, there may be dozens upon dozens upon dozens of that particular read code. Okay? So you're understanding me that when I talk about a read code, there could be some confusion. You think I mean this, I mean the whole chunk of data. So there's a lot of data obviously held for thousands of people over many years in a GP practice. Is that, is it we're now talking about a very specific, and this is one. This is the right down. It was right down to the where we're where we're fighting. As of 
a couple of weeks ago. This is a request, a care.data request, that the commissioning board, now calling itself NHS England, has requested, or actually it is directing, <coughs> the information centre to upload from every GP practice in England. The request that we saw, I think which, which some of the documentation has been in, published on now, uh, contained a bullet pointed list of over 100 data sets, which might be about a condition like diabetes or liver cancer or something like that. A data set may contain many, many read codes. Yeah? And so this care.data request is going to take approximately six to eight weeks to turn from the list that has been asked for into the actual read codes that get shot down that channel to the GP extraction tools. Yeah? I don't know, we don't know how many exactly read codes it will be, but again, I am told by one of our more IT expert uh, GP colleagues that looking at the data sets uh, that they've got and the, and the beginnings of the, the list of, of read codes, this could be extracting millions of read coded items from uh, every GP practice in England. And each one of them is associated with well, several pieces of information, but I put the ones that, again, are identifiable. Your NHS number, your date of birth, your gender, your postcode, your ethnicity. So we are talking about identifiable data being sucked up en masse from every GP practice in England. So let's just have a look at how it operates. So this time, well obviously, the commissioning board is a funny sort of customer. It's the customer that pays everyone the wages. Um, it's got the hang on the hold on the budget. I don't think they had any problems getting past that stage. The, under the Act, the Health and Social Care Act, it has in section 20, 254 a power to direct yeah, the information centre. Unlike other customers, it can actually tell the information centre what to do. The information centre itself, under the Act, interestingly, has a power, if directed, to be able to require a GP, not request, but require a GP to upload data in identifiable form. And this is new. This is unique, and this is what breaks medical confidentiality. For if my GP, the data controller of my medical record, who I go to talk to, can be required to upload my identifiable information to someone else, they are not the controller of that information which has been uploaded. Yeah? That's not just me saying it, that's the Information Commissioner's Office saying and confirming it. The data controller, it is still unclear who it is, uh, because we don't know ultimately how this require um, bit is going to pan out, still up for dispute. It will be someone other than your GP. It will either be the information centre or it will be the commissioning board that has directed the information centre to do it. So all of a sudden you're in a situation where you, the patient, go into your doctor, you talk to your doctor, you say something to your doctor, that episode, that event is recoded, associated with other, other data, and then at least in the first instance, the read codes are pulled up in identifiable form to someone else who is then the data controller of that data. You felt the fact that we really ignore the read code um, that says, please don't put my records in the summary care record. Well, this is, this, this is what we were fighting with them, uh, Jeremy Hunt's people yesterday afternoon about. Um, we're in a live fight, sorry, I should say, I mean, we're, we're launching today, but we've been going at this hammer and tongs for two months. There are some read codes which say, and Ian rightly points out, the fight that we had before was on something called the summary rec care record. Uh, there are some other read codes which say, don't send my information up uh, or outside of the GP practice um, 
uh, for those purposes. The problem is, we've got a law that's coming after that, uh, and they're trying to do something which is far greater than that, and though they say, you know, notionally they agree, it would be very stupid of them not to respect the opt outs we have not yet got a definitive answer, nor a mechanism that, sa that says they will do it. They say they will, but how? How are they going to do it? If they're sucking up all this data, how are they going to do it? We want to know what that mechanism is so that patients can know what their mechanism is so that they can do it. Um, I have to say, I was up in Calderdale a couple of weekends ago, which happens to be near where the information centre is based, uh, actually speaking to a patient whose doctor, whose GP, is in the same practice as the clinical lead for the information centre. Okay? That patient told me that her GP, who is in the same practice as the guy who's the clinical lead for the information centre, didn't know anything about this at all. So even the GPs don't know what's going on. That's scary. Can I just clarify one point? Yep. You seem to be making, up until 1st of April, yep. GPES was used only to extract aggregate data? That's right. There were mechanisms. GPES is, is sort of going to be switched on for care.data. Right. There was a mechanism for, for example, um, uh, paint. It's called QOF. Quality is, it's matching against a, a quality outcomes framework. And the data that went up in order for GPs to get points to get paid, um, went up in aggregate uh, form. Um, as I say, it is not the case that identifiable data has never left your GP practice. Yeah? What we're talking about is this generalised, sort of general purpose pipe being used for you know, aggregate, de-identified, and now massive amounts of identifiable data. So does that answer your question? Uh, so just clarity. Great clarity. Hasn't done anything yet. Yeah, it's, it's not on yet. Yeah. Right. Uh, so next. So I've described something to you. Probably it's already ringing maybe a few alarm bells. Probably because of the way I presented it. But I want to be very clear. In the care.data request that was approved just um, yeah, less than two weeks ago. Um, it was said, and you have to read these, these documents all, all, all the way through, that for this first release, for this first version of the care.data request, the outputs of it from the information centre will not be identifiable. That's not a promise that for the next release it won't be. And once you've got the flow of data going up, yeah, there may be a, another sort of loop around the block to try and get it to say, oh, well, now we want to be able to you know, pass on identifiable data. But you've already got a vast chunk of the population of England's medical records flowing up on a monthly basis to the information centre. So that worries me. Language like that isn't explicitly saying it will never be. Yeah? For this first release should make you nervous. I'm not going to go into this bullet point too because there are people far, far better than me um, to explain this, but there are no guarantees that can be given around the re-identification of what is, they're calling anonymised data, but which actually will be treated, it will be pseudonymised, so um, yeah, identifiable bits of data will be replaced with less identifiable bits of data, that's pseudonymisation, or de-identified, some of the identifying fields will be removed. Anyway, I'll leave um, Ian and probably Ross to, to fill you in on that. The other, other one is, sorry to have taken so long and to have laboured the point to get you through this particular flow, but that is just one flow. Okay, Care.data is a big one. GPES is a pipe which, as you say, has not been switched on yet, but will be there as a, a mechanism for you know, a whole number of flows going up. And the incomplete list that we've seen of um, extracts, as they call it, or data flows, um, has already identified, I think it's uh, 54 um, patient identifiable or person confidential data, um, data flows. Yeah? 
It is also the case, and we've only really been talking about the GP practice here. Of course, data is gathered all sorts of other places, at hospitals, clinics, when you have a sample sent off to a pathology lab. You know, there are all sorts of other ways in which your information, um, for whatever reason you may have gone to see the NHS, may be able to be passed back up uh, to the information centre. The really tough one that we're again sort of uh, fighting hard on, well, as hard as we can, but this goes in front of a body very, very shortly. There's something called Section 251. Forgive me if, if any of you know this. This is something that pre exists the Health and Social Care Act. Section 251 is an extraordinary power of the Secretary of State under the NHS Act. 2006, referring back to previous regulations, it is a power of the Secretary of State to set aside the common law duty of confidentiality for you know, patient identifiable information, for identifiable information, and it is only for identifiable information, to be used without seeking consent of the patient. This power, as I say, it's an extraordinary power, and it has been deployed and, 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 and is deployed, you know, oftentimes for um, forms of medical research where it may be hard to get um, consent from patients. Maybe the patients, you know, it's from a long time ago, the patients are dead, or you know, it is just very, very difficult to do so. It has also started to be used um, for broader, more blanket purposes. So. Uh, I think I remember I said there was this period where um, it was unlawful after April the 1st for looking at um, identifiable data. Um, that was because the primary care trusts had a section 251 exemption to be able to cover um, what's called secondary uses, the secondary uses service, looking at identifiable data for uses other than your direct medical care. What's really scary is that the commissioning board has applied, has received their emergency three months sort of cover for the, the mess they made with the primary care trust, is applying for another renewable, year-long, blanket exemption to be able to pass around identifiable data, that section 251 is only about identifiable data, amongst itself and all of those other bodies, commissioning bodies, that I showed you on that slide. I think, do I have another? Is it on the next slide? I think it might be on. No, it's not. So we go back one. Sorry. So, so, what does this mean? I'm not saying that care.data first version will not be treated in the way that they say it will be, because we're watching them. They'd be very stupid to do something like passing identifiable information um, out from, from it. But I am saying that there's a large amount of identifiable, uh, identifiable data you know, flowing, and explicitly the policy is to get more of this data flowing. You know, the excuses or the reasons or the justifications they're using to do this are, oh, well, it's okay, but we can anonymise it so it's not identifiable. There's problems with that. Oh, we've got a legal you know, um, way of doing this, so that can, that can get around it. They actually haven't gone to the most obvious, sensible so difficult sometimes way of doing it, which is to ask people, to ask consent. It's our data, yeah? it's for our care, if you want to use it for something else, then ask us. Yeah? And the next slide, I'll just jump to it straight away, the price list. So, the information centre, this is not new, this is, these price lists have been up for quite a while, this is where, how your data is actually sold. I just wanted to point out the fact that, whether you knew it or not, identifiable data for any particular one of these data sets which are already extracted, already available, you know, is being sold in identifiable form for an additional, this is a, a little spreadsheet that they put out, a cost calculator for you to work out how much it's going to cost you to get a certain chunk of data. Um, you know, so if you went for some A&E data, for example, there'd be a little drop down, and these are the additional fees it would be to get that data in identifiable form. You have to be approved by that data access advisory group, you have to pay for the identifiable data. Um, 
We found you know, four price lists already. Yeah? Again, I'm not saying they're going to be selling it out the back door, out of it, fell off the back of a van. And this pipe um, is probably quite narrow, too narrow. Um, you know, they're not going to offset the large amount of their budget by flogging stuff off our medical information off at 140 quid a pot for the identifiable version. Yeah? So, what they are going to do is to try to stimulate economic activity in the British economy. This means this data has to get out. Yeah? The policy is grounded, the, the whole rationale behind this is, and it's one of the explicit reasons they give uh, in the care.data request, is to stimulate economic activity in you know, the UK economy. Your medical records are being commoditized. Someone has said, you know, information, data is the new oil. Well, some of the most valuable oil is, you know, sitting around in this room. Our medical data, um, you know, is going to be used to drive a new economic model. I think that's it. Oh, right. This some, give you, there are some slightly more expensive ways to get it. These are subscriptions. So, you know, it's... it's, it's Making some money. I think that's it. Okay, my last number. I'm not saying that no one knows about this. Obviously, all of you here hopefully now know something about it. But that is the number of people, as of today, that they've told about this. Yeah? We're talking about something they got approval on doing the care.data request which will take six to eight weeks to convert into the codes to be able to send down, or start sending down, and start bringing up data, we don't know how much, they haven't told anyone yet. This is going to affect 50 million people, soon or ultimately. Why haven't they told anyone? We'll find out maybe a bit more later on. Thank you very much.